When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Now, as we turn the page from chapter 10 to chapter 11 and shift from the first half of our lesson to the second half, it's on the heels of that conversation about true messengers that Paul is going to pick up and run. He's going to continue to emphasize this because he's serving in the face of, of skepticism. Even among the saints, some wondering, who is this guy and why? <laughs> Who does he think he is to call us out for our so-called sin? I mean, he, there's no worldly wisdom here. There's no polished rhetoric. Doesn't he know we're Corinthians? We have all knowledge and all utterance. Oh, yeah, and all pride. And so Paul, fighting pride with humility, hmm, is this going to work? What can he say and how can he say it in such a way that people will begin to take him more seriously? Yes, some already have, and it pricked their consciences and their hearts, and with godly sorrow they repented of their sins, and it thrilled Paul. But then these other skeptics, a little more hardened hearts, hard for God to write upon the, tab the tablets because they're not fleshy. Oh, their heart is the stone of Sinai. Will they change? As we study now chapter 11 and 12 and 13, Paul is going to begin spending some more time about or some more time on true messengers and why it's so important to recognize their apostolic authority and, and follow their words of, of wisdom. Chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, maybe a little facetiously, a little tongue-in-cheek, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, bear with me. I mean, some of you have been accusing me of that. Weak when I'm present, only strong when I'm absent. Oh, this this is guy like this this little guy. He's like the court jester. He's not an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is just folly. Well, fine if that's what you think. Could you just bear with me a little longer? For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. We already saw him talk about godly sorrow. Well, what's godly jealousy look like? Well, let me show you. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And that's the kind of jealousy Paul is hinting at. I'm the, the ultimate matchmaker. And the match I've made is between the God of Israel and the house of Israel, along with all those Gentiles that are being adopted in. I am, I'm trying to, to seal the, the betrothal between Christ and the church. I, and what I'm most worried about. I mean, picture this. If, if Paul is playing Papa here, he's the father of the bride. And the bride is the church. The bridegroom is Christ. And Christ, of course, will ever be faithful to his covenant companion. Oh, it's just this fickle daughter of mine, as Paul feels, that I'm worried about. And it's up to me as the father to protect the chastity and virtue of my daughter, especially during this engagement phase. And I don't have anything to worry about from my future son-in-law. I know he is as faithful and virtuous as the day is long. But my daughter, oh, she's got a history. And I'm trying to help her maintain her virtue. She is a chaste virgin to Christ. I've got to keep her that way. She's espoused to one husband, and so I don't want her eyes to wander or her thoughts to her mind to meander. No, it's got to be brought into, into captivity to Christ. And, and a powerful metaphor here, as Paul is trying to convince his hearers, you're the betrothed, okay? And I'm trying to keep you pure. Remember how many times last year in the Old Testament we saw idolatry and adultery connected? We talked about covenant infidelity, 
Have you been cheating on God? Have you been unfaithful in your covenants? That's what is keeping Paul up at night. And he's concerned about this. So please, if you're engaged to Christ, if you've made covenants with him, please be true to that. Be a chaste virgin to Christ. But here's the problem. Verse 3 and 4. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if he receive another spirit, which he have not received, or another gospel, which he have not accepted, he might well bear with him. And that's what scares me to death. That's what I fear, that you're going to put up with falsehood, that you're going to roll over and, and be seduced away from the Savior. In fact, that word beguiled that he uses in reference to Eve can be translated as deceived and seduced. And so think about seduction in the marriage metaphor. And no wonder this father is so careful with his daughter. Overprotective, you might think, like some of the Corinthians did. But Paul is just trying to keep them true to the covenant they're making in the face of seduction from outside voices. Did you catch that in verse 4? Another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And you're bearing with that? You're not up in arms, pushing back and, and fighting to hold on to your faith? Some pseudo gospel and you're like, oh, it sounds good. Man, you, are, you might as well go all the way up to Athens and climb Mars Hill and be up there just listening to new things and ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. I'm worried about your intellectual pride that's leading you down that path because it's drawing, away, drawing you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. I mean, this is a key verse to the Corinthians. In some ways, we can take this passage, verse 1 through 4, and couple it with 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and, and the intellectualism that Paul was pushing back against. Do you get a sense sometimes among the well-educated or the intellectually proud, always looking for some new thing, oh, more questions, almost an avoidance of answers, and they, they grow bored with the simple truths of the gospel. I sometimes have seen that even among my BYU students. I remember one, one young man once said in a class, like, oh, I just, I just want the mysteries. And, and there was this, I don't know, this, he was unsatisfied with simple truths, and so he just, he wanted mysteries. And it's like, what, are you, what kind of mysteries are you talking about, right? And it was like, I, I, I'm bored at the tree trunk, and I just want to keep... Walk, walk, you know, walking out further and further on the branches. Well, eventually that branch isn't going to support you. Uh, is, is there even a branch beneath your feet? <laughs> in, in the face of one of those questions, I just want the mysteries. I'm like, oh, you want a mystery? Oh, I'll give you a mystery. Kind of look around nervously like, okay, don't tell me about this one. But man, once you figure this out, mm, life's going to change. Like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah. It's called charity. Figure that one out. Go reread 1 Corinthians 13 and see if, you're, if you've truly mastered the pure love of Christ. Oh, that, that'll, that'll keep you up at night. You understand that there's something about this being corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I remember, actually, we did a, uh, a survey among the students at the University of Utah Institute to get a sense of their positive and negative experiences and how we could improve Institute for their sake. And it was interesting to read their comments about what made things positive for a positive experience and some for a negative among their complaints. And that was really what I wanted to know. Okay, I think it was Bill Gates that once said, your greatest source of information will be unhappy customers. Hmm. Well, I wanted to meet some unhappy former Institute customers, students. And what went wrong? And it was interesting, two complaints that almost seemed to be at total odds with each other. 
One complaint was uh, sometimes Institute just feels like seminary reheated and I'm learning nothing new. It's just the same old stuff. And uh, I already know this. Oh, yeah, that might be intellectual pride on their part, but maybe, eh, Lord is it I, well, perhaps. Maybe I'm, I'm not giving them deeper understanding of these truths. So that was one complaint. But then there was the, an almost opposite one. And some complained, like, sometimes I come to Institute, and I don't know, it's like the, the teacher is trying to push the envelope so far that it's things that are, like, so esoteric, and, and it's like, is this true? I've never heard this. Where is this even coming from? It, the complaint, in essence, was, is there it, too much speculation in some classes? And, and the teacher's off in the corner with his tie over his shoulder and says, well, what about this possibility? And we're like, I don't know. What are you talking about? And what struck me about this was there was complaints on one extreme of it's too simple and complaints on the other, it's unnecessarily complex. It's too speculative. And I thought, are you guys just canceling each other out? And then I realized, oh, no, 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 we've got some contraries to prove. And one group was complaining about too cold, and the other was complaining about too hot, which means there's a Goldilocks zone in the middle. And how do we make Institute deep without being overly complicated? How do we keep things simple without making them simplistic? You understand? Uh, we, we, we're not trying to create a group of, of Gnostics with some, some Gnostic gospel and only those in the know. So let's go out and speculate together. No, that's a problem. That's being corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That's, and it's so seductive, especially among those given to the life of the mind. Oh, no wonder there are certain fringe groups growing within the church among some of the best of the saints as they're being peddled false prophecy from false prophets, saying, oh, we know more than the apostles do. We're super apostles. <laughs> We're wiser messengers, so come with us. Oh, it's seductive, all right. It's playing to your pride. It's, it's appealing to your intellectual arrogance. And it is drawing you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. Again, that doesn't mean it has to be so simplistic that it's like, oh, I've heard this a million times. My goal in teaching is to take things that people already know, scriptures that have always been in front of them, and go deeper to appreciate them more and to understand their greater relevance and connect the dots across the board. But I, I pray that I haven't come across as speculative. No, I want to hold to true doctrine. I do not want to seduce anyone from the simplicity that is in Christ. Maybe that's the simplicity on the other side of complexity that Elder Hafen has talked about. Okay, Powerful, powerful verse. I also need to say something, though, because some of you may have, like, whoa, 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 don't move on to verse 5 yet, because there was something in verse 3 that I'm, well, I got a bone to pick. And it's this idea about Eve being beguiled by the serpent's subtlety. Hmm. Wait a minute, I thought it was a fortunate fall. Oh, wait a minute, I thought Eve did something courageous. Well, yes and yes. The fall is fortunate, absolutely necessary in the Father's plan. And Eve was incredibly courageous in partaking of the fruit. Okay, Hold to that. Then why would Paul say that she was beguiled? Well, first of all, can we keep things in context? Always important in our scripture study. Is this, is 2 Corinthians a discourse on Eden? Is it an explanation of the fall? And Paul is walking you through and trying, it's like, no, it isn't. In some ways, it's like, wait, wait, where, why are you, is this a tangent? Where did Eve come from? He kind of popped it out of nowhere. Well, she appears as an analogy, and that's it. Be careful about using this verse as some kind of an establishment of doctrine to say, yep, Eve was guilty and she had no idea what she was doing and Satan totally tricked her and, and no wonder women have been the source of, of all kinds of problems ever since. Because sadly, a lot of history, a lot of society has gone that route. Okay? So in context, Paul is not giving a doctrinal discourse on 
on the fall of humanity through Eve. What he's talking about is be very careful about people who are seducing you away from the simple truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Beware of those false prophets that are giving you a false gospel. Those false Christs that are presenting another Jesus than the one that you know that we have preached you, to you. And then Paul, as he always did, scouring the pages of the Old Testament to find examples and analogies. Oh, here's a good one. And I'm just going to throw it out and then move on to other topics because I'm not here to talk about Eve. I'm just going to bring her up as an example of someone that, oh, you got to be careful because you might end up being seduced by someone else's subtlety. You might end up being beguiled. Now, if to the degree that Eve was beguiled, because I want to honor that possibility as well, because it, is a, it was a transgression, and we talked about this at length last year when we studied Genesis and, and the fall and Eve's role in it. But So I want to honor her courage and her wisdom, her knowledge, that there's no way we can live the first commandment of multiplying and replenish the earth if we don't allow the consequences of partaking of the fruit to take place. But was she beguiled? Well, yes and no. I, I, as my students have and I have wrestled with this together, I've often asked them, when you return missionaries out there, when you put in your papers and accepted your mission call, did you know what you were getting yourself into? And they're like, yeah. Oh, no. I mean, I sort of did. I, I wanted to serve. I kind of knew what a mission was like. But yeah, just kind of. It was way harder than I thought. Okay, yeah. How about any students that are married? When you proposed, when you accepted, and when you were sealed in the temple, did you know what you were getting yourself into with marriage? And they're like, of course we, oh, no, no, not, not well, a little, but not entirely. Like, oh, yeah, uh-huh. Uh, when you graduated from high school and, and applied to college and you started <laughs> your education, your higher education, did you know what you were getting yourself into? And again, the answer is, yeah, oh, no. When we accepted the plan of salvation and shouted for joy, as Job says, did we know what we'd signed up for? Yes. And not entirely. And that's just life. We can make sense and it's the right thing to do, but I don't, I've never lived it. And there's all, going to be all kinds of unknowns. Well, does that describe Eve pretty well? I know I must partake. There's no other way. But did she really know everything about what she was getting herself into? And getting her husband into? And making that decision when he wasn't present when the consequences of that decision would definitely affect them both. Was there some subtlety on the serpent's part? You better believe it. Half-truths and questioning commandments and dividing the pair and so on. Was there some beguiling, some seducing, some deceiving? Yes. Despite Eve's wisdom and courage in making that choice. You understand? That, that's all I'll say about, about the fall and about Eve's role in it. Here, let's get back to Paul's topic. I'm just, a, I'm just worried about subtlety. I'm worried about seduction. I'm worried about deception. Everything that Jesus warned them about in, in the Olivet Discourse and the signs of the times of Matthew 24 with false prophets and false teachers and false Christs, deceiving the very elect according to the covenant. Is it already happening among the Corinthian saints? Yes. And Paul is pushing back against it. In every letter, he's pushing back against apostasy. And here he's trying to help them hold to the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. His is good advice to follow even in our day as we face similar struggles. But then verse 5 through 7. Back to reestablishing his apostolic authority in the face of skepticism. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. 
And this was likely said sarcastically, with a bit of irony there, some sting. Because these are just the so-called chiefest apostles. These are those super apostles that people seem... And again, apostles, lowercase a, this is not the quorum of the twelve. An apostle is, in the lowercase a, is merely someone who is sent. We could say missionaries. So some chief missionary who claims greater authority than I have and is coming trying to seduce you away from the gospel with, with the Gnostic knowledge. No, be, beware of that. Be careful in this situation. I'm not a wit behind them. Okay? Please, he's not comparing himself to Peter, James, and John. And I deserve to be among the original 12. I was just born too late. No. Just those of you who are being seduced away from the simplicity with this higher thinking of these so-called super servants. No. I'm not a, a sliver. I'm not a wit behind them. But though I be rude in speech, fine, if that's what you think. If my voice is too squeaky. If, if, if I come across as unpolished in my rhetoric, fine. Though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. I know what I'm talking about. I know of, of whom I speak. I saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. I am not rude in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. So living among you for a year and a half, yeah, you see my human frailty. You see my weakness. It's all been made manifest. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? That's all Paul has ever wanted to do is serve them, build the kingdom, connect them to Christ. And he's been lowering himself every step of the way. Remember we saw this earlier. Which I, I didn't take the, the, your donations. I didn't ask for them. I didn't want to be beholden to anyone else. So no, I provided for myself, making, making tents. But my real purpose in all of this was to extend the tent of Zion so you could all come in. I have been abasing myself so you could be exalted. Jesus did the same thing. He who was rich became poor so that out of his poverty we could become rich. That's all I've been trying to do. In verse 8 and 9, he continues his self-defense. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. Now, again, this is just hyperbole here, right? He was speaking sarcastically before. Now it's hyperbolic. And it's like, what? I, there I was, robbing other churches, taking wages so I could come and do you service. Now, he's not robbing anyone. But it does su suggest that in other congregations, he did receive or accept, I should say, he did accept some financial help in order to travel to Corinth in the first place, okay? But here I am, robbing those churches, as some might say. I'm taking wages of them. I'm a, I'm a, that's priestcraft. That's what I am guilty of, right? Oh, yeah, because, because I, I allowed someone else to help me cross the ocean, travel across the Mediterranean to be able to come to Corinth. No, I've come to do you service. And when I was present with you, he continues, and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. What he's pushing, this goes back to what we saw in, earlier in his letters. You're mad because I wouldn't accept your financial assistance? And now you're mad because I did accept financial assistance from others just to be able to make the journey to get here? Man, darned if I do, darned if I don't. And do you want me to be beholden to you? And that's why you're trying to offer? Or you don't want me to be burden? I don't want to be a burden. I have always just wanted to lift up, not way down. And I don't plan on changing that approach. I will provide for myself and I will trust in the provisions that the Lord gives me. I'll be the lily that he clothes and the sparrow that he feeds. I'm not worried about purse or scrip. The Lord always takes care of his own. But I, I pray you'll recognize me as one of his own. Please believe me in all of this. As passionately as Paul feels about all of this, it reminds me of a phrase that Elder Neil A. Maxwell coined years ago. He talked about high-yield, low-maintenance members. 
And I remember when I first heard that at a meeting of church educators, I just thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be high yield, low maintenance. That you don't have to give me anything. Oh, the Lord will provide. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't want to take any fast offerings. I don't want other people to have to serve me. No, pile up the callings and put me to work, and I'm just going to yield, yield, yield. I want good harvest here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sow bountifully and let the Lord reap bountifully for my efforts. And that's always been my approach to discipleship. High yield, low maintenance. Well, it was interesting. Our last few years of, in Tennessee were hard. A lot of mental health challenges in the family and some real struggles and just trying to survive it all. And by the end, my wife and four of our kids were already in Utah getting some help. And my, myself and my oldest daughter were back in Tennessee. And for six months, it was kind of distance in the family and just trying to figure things out. And the CES, or church education, was kind to say, you know what? We like families living in the same state. We should, we should move you back to Utah. If that's where you can get the help for your family that they need, then by all means, we'll give you an assignment. And the church members, our neighbors there in Tennessee, were so kind to help us get our house ready to sell. Uh, honestly, I was at the edge of my own sanity. And I couldn't have... There was so much about getting the house ready that I couldn't do. And I was so grateful for just amazing members of our ward and, and neighbors and just people that came to our rescue in, in real ways. I owe you more than you realize, those old friends of mine. And I remember <laughs> moving to Utah and clean slate and a new ward and, and meeting with the bishop as he got to know our family. And I remember saying to him, Bishop, I need you to know that for the last couple of years, our family has been, or I said, through most of our lives, my wife and I have been really focused on being high yield, low maintenance members. And we're the type that you can give heavy callings to, and we just roll up our sleeves and get at it, and we're here to work, and we're here to serve, and just bless the people around us. So we're, we're, great, we're grateful to be here, and, and we're, ready to, we're, ready to, we're ready to go. And then I said, wait, well, explain a little bit of our, our last few years in Tennessee and wh what brought us here, there and understand, helped him understand what our family was dealing with. And I said, the last few years, it's felt like we've been, more, we've been the opposite. And we've been low yield, high maintenance. And we haven't been able to give as much as we're used to in our callings. And people have had to come to our rescue uh, to help us with children and issue, family, you know, and all, everything. And... I've been so grateful that people, other people, have been willing to come to our, our aid. I think we're in a little better place. <laughs> I think we've found some help and, and things are getting more stable because we would love to once again become high yield, low maintenance instead of low yield, high maintenance. And our wonderful bishop just smiled and expressed his love and said, either way, we're grateful to have you. <laughs> And if you are ready to give, great. If you still need to receive, that's great too. And, and we all seem to go back and forth between times where we can be high yield, low maintenance, and times where we are low yield, high maintenance. It's okay. And I was just so reassured and so grateful for that welcome. And we've, we've been fluctuating back and forth ever since in our family ups and downs and the roller coaster of life. I just love Paul for his, the righteousness of his desire. I don't want to be chargeable. I don't want to be burdensome. I just want to lift where I stand. But I pray you'll lift alongside me as much, with as much strength as you're able to give. That's all. The Lord loveth a cheerful giver, right? Give what you can, but with a smile on your mouth. Then verse 10 through 12. Paul continues, as the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, oh, God knoweth. And there seems to be a little sarcasm there, at least some irony. What, you don't think I love you? Oh, God knows. God knows that I do love you. I have given proof of the sincerity of my love, 
ever since I stepped foot in Corinth years ago. Here he says, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Now think about the phrase he just used, to cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. Occasion for what? We would say an excuse. An excuse for what? And there are some people out there that are just looking for an excuse to attack you, looking for an excuse to dismiss you, to, to judge you. Some are looking for an excuse to be offended or to leave the church, and they just want to feel justified in that decision. And unfortunately, if you're looking for justification, you'll probably find it. Unless you're someone like Paul, who's striving with all his heart to eliminate that possibility, to cut off occasion, to not give them that excuse that they're looking for. I mean, think about it in these terms. Elder Hales, Robert D. Hales, said this about, in his talk called Christian Courage. It's one of my favorite talks. Especially when I do interfaith work, or, or am I going to face a situation where people might a, a, oppose me? I'll go and reread that talk. And in it, he says, when people say that you're not a Christian, if they accuse you of not being Christian, the worst thing you can do is to prove them right by the way you respond. And I'm like, ooh, that's genius, Elder Hales. It's like, oh, you're not even a Christian. I get so up in arms and I'm so angry that I, like, ooh, yeah, see, that, that's not how Jesus would do it. He would have turned the other cheek. Mm, darn it, you're right. Or how about this example? When somebody leaves the church, because they're, man, they're muttering under, under their breath saying, oh, because Mormons are judgmental and holier than thou. Well, be very careful the way you react to their departure. Because if you get angry at them and start saying, well, it's your fault and this and that, you're, well, we just proved them right. Because we reacted in a judgmental, holier than thou kind of way. Hmm. Now, I know it's impossible to be completely innocent when someone is trying to make you an offender for a word or looking for anything you might be doing wrong to use it as an excuse for their, their appraisal of you or their association or lack thereof of the church. You understand what I'm saying. But can we do better at, at not giving them occasion can we be more blameless and respond to people in such a loving way that it gives them second thoughts as they leave? Like, huh, that did not go the way I thought it would. I was being a jerk to them in hopes they'd be a jerk back to me so I would know that, hey, we're both still jerks. But instead, darn it, they kept the higher moral ground. They cut off occasion, even though I desired occasion. I wanted to fight back, and they refused to fight. Ah, that's the anti-Nephi-Lehi's. That's Gandhi. That's Martin Luther King Jr. That's Jesus. I hope it's us. Now, verse 13 through 15, this is what Paul's up against. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And another way to say transforming themselves into would be masquerading as. Oh, that's, again, so close to Matthew 24's warning about false Christs and false prophets and false teachers. People pretending to be something that they're not. They're masquerading. These are false apostles. Oh, dressed up as true apostles of Christ. False messengers wanting to come across as true. And no marvel, he goes on. For Satan himself is transformed or masquerades as an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Oh, please beware of counterfeits, my dear Corinthians. And if you can pull away the hypocrite's mask, if you can see through the masquerade, by their fruits ye shall know them. Someday that fruit will be made manifest. Someday that end will be according to their work. Oh, but in the meantime, I hope you have discerning eyes 
a discerning heart to be able to recognize false messengers, wolves in sheep's clothing, pretending to be true messengers instead. Now, verse 16, I say again, let no man think me a fool, though that's probably what you're muttering under your breath. If otherwise, well, fine. Yet as a fool, receive me, that I may boast myself a little. And again, there's some, oh, some word play on Paul's part. Makes it hard for us as readers, but it must have been fun for them who understood what he was saying. You think me a fool? Great. Well, you'd probably even let a fool at least speak. I mean, the court jester does get to, get to talk, even in the presence of a king. So, hey, can I, can I take my cap and bells and give you a word, some words of wisdom? If so, that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Now, seeing that many glory after the flesh, well, I, fine, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing yourselves are wise. Oh, to suffer fools gladly. That's, this is the verse where that, that phrase comes from. And it's just, it just means to kind of let things go. Just put up with stuff. It's beneath you. But yeah, just it, it kind of pat them on the head and ignore what they're saying. But suffer those fools gladly. Fine, if you think that I'm a fool, will you suffer me? Will you let me speak? If so, here's my message. Verse 20 and 21 for ye suffer, in other words, you put up with this, ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I mean, you'll take all of that. I, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. In other words, I speak it as a matter of reproach to myself, as though we were weak. How, how be it wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Now, really confusing, but what's he saying here? Are you really going to suffer it? Are you really going to take it when somebody brings you into bondage? Are you just going to roll over and be enslaved to someone? Or what about when somebody comes to devour you? I mean, just they're gobbling up all your household goods. You're going to let that happen too? What about if they smite you in the face? You just, you just take it? No, of course not. But what he's saying is, but you take it when these false prophets come in. You take it when these false messengers, these superior missionaries preaching their falsehoods to you, and you take it all? No, we've got to fight back. We've got to stand up for what we know to be true. Now again, he said it earlier, my warfare is not the warfare of the world. I'm going to trust in the Spirit of God, but you better believe I'm going to hold to it. I'll turn the other cheek physically, but I'm not going to do that spiritually and just let you roll right over the revelation God has given me. You might take my household goods and, yeah, okay, but you're not going to take away my testimony. Oh, no. I know these things are true. I'm a witness of the resurrection. And so you want me to be bold? Oh, I'll be bold. You want me to prove my apostolic authority? You want me to show you my street cred? Well, buckle up. Put your big boy pants on. We're ready to rumble. The way he says it in verse 22 to 25. Are they Hebrews? Well, so am I. Are they Israelites? Well, so am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Ooh, how about even, let's get closer to those so-called super apostles. Are they ministers of Christ? Oh, I speak as a fool. I am more. Or as the JST puts it, so am I. I I'm all of those things that these people claim to be. I am a true messenger in the face of falsehood, and I'll prove myself. How's this for credentials? In labors more abundant. I don't know if there's ever been a messenger of the Lord who has served more diligently than I. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. Let me take the, the robe off my back, and you can see all of the scars that I've gained from my service. 
above measure. I've lost count. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. In fact, I can be more specific than that. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And if that's not bad enough, keep reading in verse 26. In journeyings, often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils by mine own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. Take your pick. In perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hungers and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. And if that wasn't bad enough, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, namely, the care of all the churches. How this is a resume of affliction. And every entry in it stands as evidence that Paul cannot be moved, that Paul is willing to die daily for his testimony of the Lord who overcame death for him and for us all. These are such powerful verses as Paul, you want me to be bold? Well, here's boldness. I'm a Hebrew more than you are. I'm an Israelite more than you. I'm, I'm more closely related to Abraham than any of you could claim. I'm a true messenger. And the evidence I can offer is what I've been willing to endure. I am sincere in my testimony of Jesus. And I'm willing to face storm and suffering whips and wounds, peril after peril after peril. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation, as he said in the Romans. Paul is as good as they come. He's as serious about his service as any, as any missionary, as any apostle could be. And there's his evidence. He goes on in verse 29. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? Or the JST, and I anger not. What he's describing there is empathy for others. If you're weak, I'm right there with you. If you're offended, then I'm ticked off. Okay, I, I take seriously your weaknesses, your affliction, whatever you go through, I'm right there with you. He says, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. That's what I'm most proud of, all these stripes. To me, they are badges of honor. Every scar bears witness of my commitment to Christ, and I glory in it. I glory in my adversity because it's proof of my conviction. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. So I've given you all this evidence, <laughs> exhibit A through Z, and now I'm calling God himself to the witness stand. He'll testify that I'm not lying here. In fact, one other piece of evidence that just comes to mind. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. That's how much opposition I faced then. You think I'm scared of the so-called super apostles here in Corinth? Not at all. Back then, when, when the garrison was after me, through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. I mean, think about this. What are we willing to endure for the kingdom of God's sake? Paul gave us quite the list. What's on ours? Will we endure late nights? early mornings? Will we endure hard times and hard callings? Will we go on missions and treks and temple trips and, and magnify every chance that we have to serve? Will we endure opposition 
and face persecution? Will we overcome apostasy? Will we hold to the faith? Come what may. That's what Paul's asking. I remember as a kid, I've shared this before, but I was a senior in high school and I went to a friend's ward to see their mission farewell and then I stayed for the other two hours just because I liked, had friends in that ward and wanted to hang out with them in Sunday school and young men's. Then I went to my ward and was there for the three hours and then I had a church meet, a youth committee meeting for two hours and by the end of that Sunday I was beaming and I came home and I told my dad, who was in the state presidency at the time, Dad, I had like an eight hour day at church today, it was amazing. And <laughs> oh, after an even longer day himself, my dad just smiled and said, eight hours, huh? Man, good for you. That's a good start. <laughs> and that's all it was compared to his. It was a good start. And yes, it was a start. A start of a lifetime of service with many an eight-hour day and beyond. And then my dad said something I'll never forget. He simply said, son, nothing beats exhaustion in the Lord's service. My dad knows that exhaustion as does my mom. Paul knew that exhaustion. He knew that opposition. He knew it all. But he knew the Lord that made it all worth it. True messengers. Oh, Paul was as true to the truth as you can get. Now, what he ended chapter 11 was, oh, the temporal, the, the, the personal, the the persecution and affliction and opposition. And there's evidence for you. But if that's the negative, can I dwell on the positive for a time as well? As you turn to chapter 12, notice where he begins here. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. Or in other translations, this boasting will not do good, but I must go on. So I, I imagine all of this evidence probably hasn't even done anything. It hasn't pushed back against your skepticism, even though I have so much evidence of how fully invested in this work I am. But fine, let me shift gears and try something different. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So yeah, chapter 11 was to describe the hard things I'd suffered at the hands of man. Chapter 12, how about we describe the transcendent things I've experienced at the hands of God? And here's the first one he mentions. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. But such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man. Again, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable things which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, who was this man that Paul knew? <laughs> well, Paul knew him intimately because it was Paul himself. He's referring to himself from a distance. And maybe that was to reaffirm his own humility. Maybe this was not to draw too much of the spotlight upon himself. I still see apostles doing that in our day, bearing profound and powerful testimony of their, of their knowledge of the Lord, but doing it humbly enough so as not to draw too much of the spotlight. Their, testimony of, their testimonies of Christ are sure. When they say, I know I think they know in ways even more powerful than we do. There have been times they have hinted at, at that kind of knowledge, but in very humble ways. Here Paul is doing this so humbly as well. But what is he bearing witness of? Oh, I know. I know what paradise looks like. I can't tell you about it. It's unutterable, unspeakable words but I've experienced the ineffable. I have felt the transcendent. I've seen the Lord. I've been caught up to the third heaven. 
Think about what he said back in 1 Corinthians 15 in his witness of the resurrection. That yes, there are bodies celestial and bodies terrestrial and bodies telestial. There's the glory of the stars, but a glory of the moon. And then, oh, how's this for third heaven? The glory of the sun that surpasseth all understanding. I've been there. I've experienced that. I know of what I speak. Now, admittedly, I, I don't know everything, and I can't say everything. It's unutterable. It's not lawful for me to utter. But some of it I can't even tell. Like, was I in the body? Was I not in the body? Was this a physically present? Like, I, was I physically present there, or did God open the eyes of my understanding? Visions are so far beyond, outside of normal human experience, that I cannot blame Paul for not being able to wrap his rational mind completely around it. I, I don't know. Was I in the body? Was I not? Hard to say. Joseph Smith would say the same thing in section 137 of his vision of the third heaven when he saw the celestial glory and saw some surprising people within. He likewise said, whether in the body or out of the body, I could not tell. Or picture Lehi, when he has his vision in the very first chapter of the Book of Mormon, he says, Methought I saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded by numberless concourses of angels. And centuries later, when Alma the Younger had a similar experience, he used identical language. He says, I methought I saw even as my father, Le as our father Lehi saw God and these angels, but me thought. And skeptics would say, what do you mean me thought? You don't know if you had the vision or not? Or you, don't, you can't tell if you were in the body? Was this physically present or just some spiritual vision? Ah, forget the whole thing. Well, they, they probably already have. I have met more than a few skeptics, that, that attack the first vision, for example, simply because there are multiple accounts of it. And what Joseph said in 1832 is a little different than what he said in 1836. And what he said he, to this audience was a little different than what he said to that one. And like, well, yeah, audience is going to determine some of that. Oh, but here, this seems to be, this is a, a, a clear contradiction. Like, well, is it? Maybe. It obviously is the way you read it. I don't see the contradiction in the same way you do. But let me ask you this. Do you believe in the possibility of visions at all? And nine times out of ten, they'll say, well, no. I said, oh, so the problem is not that he, there were multiple accounts. The problem was that there were any accounts at all. And you'd still be skeptical, even if there was only one version. Hmm. It's your lack of faith in the, in the possibility. That's become your new premise. So, of course, your conclusion is going to be what it is. Me, on the other hand, I've, I love the sixth art, no, seventh article of faith. I love them all. But the seventh is the one that talks about things that we believe in as far as spiritual gifts are concerned. And visions, it's right there at the top of the list. Visions and revelation and prophecy and, and gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues and so forth. We believe those things. Now, have I experienced those things? All of them except visions. I can sign off with personal experience on every other one. But I've never had a vision. And I'm okay with that. God's given me enough evidence in other ways. But as one who can't speak to personal experience... But one who studies the way Paul talked about it here, the way Joseph Smith talked about it in BNC 137, the way Lehi talked about it, and the way Alma the Younger talked about it, I am willing to cut them all as much slack as they need. If it's so outside the norm of regular human experience that you can't even tell if it's bodily or not, and I think I'm seeing this, but what is going on here? I mean, the way that the vision... Of the third king of the third heaven came to Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon. This is section 76, the vision, where they saw actually a, a series of six visions, including the telestial, terrestrial, and celestial kingdoms. In that one, Joseph would describe what he saw, and then 
Sydney would give second witness. Yeah, that is what I see. And then Sydney would kind of pass the baton. They were like leapfrogging each other. And Sydney would describe what he saw in the next vision. And Joseph was like, yes, that's what I see too. It's like it's making sense. It's becoming clear. But there's something powerful about this experience on Paul's part. And he's invoking it as evidence of his apostolic authority. I am a witness of the resurrection. He said back in 1 Corinthians 15, I am a witness of the goal in all of this, the third heaven. I've been there, caught up. I've seen paradise, and I'm trying to bring it back down to earth. I'm trying to create a Zion here with you, if you'll let me. But you have to trust my authority. In verse 5 and 6, he says, Of such and one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Which again is a little tongue-in-cheek. He's sharing these spiritual experiences as humbly as he possibly can. He's not calling attention to himself. I know, but I can't tell you everything that I know. I can be crystal clear on my infirmities. I can count up the number of stripes that I've suffered at the, at the Roman whip. But of these ineffable, unspeakable spiritual things. Oh, I'm going <laughs> to create a, a third person and speak of myself in those terms and glory in him instead of in me, quote unquote. Number seven and eight, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Again, there he is trying to stay humble when the revelations, the visions, the experiences he's had, the miraculous things he's been a party to. Oh, those things do, do exalt me above measure. But lest I let it all go to my head, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Now this is a very famous passage regarding Paul. But it's also a bit infamous because he mentions this thorn in the flesh and doesn't explain what it is, which has led to all kinds of speculation for centuries. And some have wondered, oh, this thorn in the flesh, was that just more persecution and, and physical tribulation that he's been through? He just listed a bunch of that, maybe. Uh, could the thorn in the flesh have been some kind of oh, phys physical malady himself? Some have talked about, could it have been some kind of speech impediment? If he's better in writing than in speaking, hmm, possible. Did he stutter? Was there a struggle there? Some have suggested, is it still some kind of vision problem? That he was blinded on the road to Damascus. And with Ananias' help, he regained his sight. But was it all the way? <laughs> was it just spiritual sight? Is he still struggling with physical sight? Is that the problem? Was it some kind of temptation? I mean, he took the escape route every time that it was, it was given, but, but man, he dealt with things that, yes, temptation is common to man, and it was common to Paul, and I just want to overcome this once and for all. Just remove the thorn. Now, though there's a part of me that really wishes Paul was crystal clear and told us what the thorn was, the bigger part of me is grateful that he didn't. Because specificity would limit relevance. I would think, oh, that was his thorn. I don't have that one. So this doesn't apply. But thorn in general, oh, yeah, that applies because I've got more than one. As do you, I'm sure. And what is your thorn in the flesh? Well, it will be specific to you, just like mine are specific to me. But I, too, have pled repeat repeatedly with the Lord. Please remove it. I don't want this trial or I don't want this temptation. I don't want this weakness or I don't want this, this struggle. Whatever the thorn might be for you, have you besought the Lord to take it away? And I'm sure you have. Notice Jesus himself had a thorn in the flesh as he knelt in the garden of Gethsemane. And again, three times he besought his Father in heaven, please remove the cup. 
or in this analogy, please pull out the thorn. But the Father left it in Jesus. And here the Lord is leaving it in Paul. But did you catch Paul's perspective? It seems, if it's only been three times, that he's come to grips and come to terms with that and not asked a fourth or a fifth or a sixth. I guess this thorn is permanent. I guess I'll always have this affliction. I'll be dealing with this temptation for the rest of my life. It's an addictive sin after all. Or this is a, an ailment that has no cure. This is the new norm for me. Well, there's even power in establishing the new norm and accepting it. Radical acceptance and just, okay, if this is what it's going to be from here on out, so be it. What does the Lord want me to do about that? I'm going to stop asking Him to change things. I'm going to ask Him to change me instead in terms of my ability to cope with all of this. And how did Paul learn to cope with it? He saw its purpose. One of which was to keep him from being exalted above measure. I mean, I have been so blessed with the abundance of revelations that without a thorn in the flesh, I might not think I had any flesh at all. Whether in the body or out of the body, oh no, I'm completely out of the body and I'm living in heaven more than I'm living in earth. But nope, that, oh, that pain I feel is a constant reminder. I haven't been exalted yet. So I guess there's still more work to be done. There's still cause to be humble. There's still cause to rely upon the Redeemer. And that's the best thing ever. If I could simply remove the thorn and be done with it, am I done with Jesus? Am I done needing his help? Or, like we saw in Romans, was the broken law just to shut my mouth and convince me I needed Jesus all along? Was my time in the pit <laughs> to cure me of my self-sufficiency, introduce me to the ropes of the Redeemer, and not only climb out of the pit with his help, but go ascend the mountaintops, which is what he was after all along. You see, to me, there's this powerful realization on Paul's part that I hope we will follow, follow his example. And if this is not going away, if this is the new norm, is it giving me a constant cause to rely on Christ? If so, then there is a rose in this thorn bush. And it is bringing beauty through my ashes. Think about the way Jacob said it in the Book of Mormon. Chapter 4 of Jacob, verse 7. Nevertheless, the Lord God showeth us our weakness, that we may know that it is by his grace and his great condescensions unto the children of men that we have power to do these things. You see that? Without that weakness... I wouldn't trust in his grace. I wouldn't know that I needed any of it. Or, even more famous, Ether 12, 27. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. And that's what he'd been doing for Paul. Oh, just look at, the, at your side. There's a thorn in there. But if they'll come, I'll show them that weakness. And I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. And, oh, if Paul had ever had the chance to meet Moroni, that would have been one of his favorite verses, I'm sure. It describes, in fact, exactly what Paul felt about his thorn, as shown in the next two verses. Verse 9 and 10, He said unto me, the Lord did, that is, as he was pleading with him to remove the thorn. The Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee. Can you see Paul and Moroni as parallel prophets? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And once Paul realized that, that because of his own weakness, it allowed God to show his strength, it convinced Paul to rely upon the Lord's power rather than his own arm of flesh. Once that dawned on him, everything changed. His attitude toward adversity 
completely shifted. And Paul was able to say, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you for being willing to learn the hard way and then being willing to teach us the hard truth. That it is through our weakness that God's power is made manifest. No wonder he wanted the weak and the simple, the unlearned and the despised to serve him. Because his light will come shining through all the cracks in our earthen vessel. Paul got it. <laughs> well, we need to get it as well. That's what will allow us to glory in our infirmities, as Paul did. Well, verse 11, I am become a fool in glorying. <laughs> That's probably what you think anyway. Like, the, this fool is excited that he's suffered so much? This guy's crazy. Well, if I'm a fool in glorying, it's your fault. Ye have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended of you. I shouldn't have to vouch for myself. You should be testifying of me. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. And again, those chiefest apostles are those pseudo-saints, those, those super apostles, those super missionaries that, they, that people are claiming others to be. No, 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 no. I'm nothing behind at all. Not one whit, he said earlier. Though I really am nothing compared to God. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And I am grateful for the mighty deeds and the signs and wonders and the patience in affliction that I have seen from apostles of the Lord in my day. Those are signs of an apostle that are as convincing to me as anything else I've seen. He then says in verse 13, For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches? Except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you. We're back to that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't burden you. I wouldn't take your money. I provided for myself. And, and now you think you're less than other churches? No, you're not. He says, forgive me this wrong. And I'm sure he said that ironically. Like, oh, I'm so sorry that I wouldn't take your money. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. So I'm ready to come back on a third trip, and I'm not going to take your money then either, okay? I want to be high yield, low maintenance. And then I love what he says next to them. For I seek not yours, but you. You catch the difference there? I'm not after yours as in your stuff. I'm not after your material goods. I, I don't, don't want you to provide for me. That's not what I'm after. What am I seeking? You. You. Your benefit, ultimately your consolation and salvation. That's why I am giving you everything I've got. I seek not yours, but you. And then an interesting analogy uh, from the family. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And again, I'm your, your father in the faith. I'm your parent in Christianity. Again, I'm the, the father matchmaker trying to watch, it, watch out for his daughter's virtue. And so you don't have to pay me. I'm, I'm paying you. To say, say to your kids, you don't have to cover my expenses. I'm here to cover yours. That's what parents do. Okay. And then he says, again, beautiful phrase, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. This is one of my favorite examples of Paul's penchant for wordplay. But what is he playing with? Well, spend and be spent. I'm not asking you to spend anything on me. Low maintenance. I will spend everything on you. In fact, I'll be spent for you until I've got nothing left to give. And then that last irony. Again, some wordplay. Unfortunately, the more abundantly I love you, the less you love me. 
that had to be the hardest irony of all for him to admit. The more I prove to you my love by not taking from you and only giving, 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 the less love you want to give to me in return. That doesn't make sense to me. I remember, I, I've told you this before, I proposed to my wife for seven months before she finally agreed to marry me. I'm an acquired taste. Maybe that's why I make these lessons so long. It's going to take you that long to finally, okay, I, I guess I learned something. He's, I guess he's okay. But in her case, as we were dating, I, there were times I just wondered, why? What, what's wrong with me? And what, what does she not see? And I remember one day I was doing the dishes. And that's often a time for me to think. And as I was doing the dishes, sadly, my thoughts turned into something of a personal pity party. I was the only one invited, but I was the only one that would, would have come anyway. And there I was, sitting in my, or washing dishes in my solitude, and kind of complaining to myself, like, what, what's, what's up with her? And what, what's taking her so long? And, what? and at, what, at one point in this conversation with myself, I said something that the Spirit must have overheard, because he responded to it. The thought that, that ascended... I asked, why doesn't she love me the way I love her? Which seems to be exactly what Paul is asking here. The more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Why don't you love me as much as I love you? And the moment I thought it, the Spirit came rushing in to say, now you know how I feel. And that was a jolting revelation. Because it hurt to love more and to be loved less. But sadly that describes God's feelings towards us perfectly. He will always love us more than we love Him. Can you picture the Lord saying that to us? Just like Paul did. The more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. I am happy to report that my wife has caught up with me and we love each other equally. I pray someday to catch up to God and love Him as much as He loves me. What Paul says next in verse 16, but be it so. He's kind of resigned to his fate. Fine, it is what it is. I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. And did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. What Paul is trying to say there, I'm not, I'm not trying to burden. I'm just high yield, low maintenance. I didn't make a gain of you. Neither did, neither did Titus. And yet you accepted him. He rejoiced in him and he rejoiced in you. What is it? Why couldn't you rejoice in me as I rejoice in you? And again, I'm not saying this in some self-serving way. I'm not jealous for my sake. I'm jealous for yours. Because if you won't accept me as an apostle then you will not take seriously the message of salvation that, I'm, that I've been sent to share. It's just like God as a jealous God. It's not for His sake, it's for ours. Because if, you don't, can't, if we don't believe in God, then how can He bless us as only He can? No, everything Paul has done has been for their edifying. And we've had plenty of evidence of that. So he says in concluding this chapter, Verse 20 and 21. For I fear, lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not. It's like we both have certain hopes for one another. I was hoping that you would live up to divine expectation, and I'm afraid that when I get there you won't be. And meanwhile, you were hoping that I'd be just as kind as, as I normally am in person, and yet 
you're forcing me to come down strong and be as bold as I typically am in writing and to be that bold in, in presence as well. What he really worries about, he describes in the next line or two, I fear lest we see each other in the wrong way and I fear lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, what a list. Paul loved his lists of sins. This is a fascinating one because they all show marks of division. It's all evidence of contention, which was one of the underlying problems that was splitting apart the Corinthian saints. He'd been working on that for two letters now, okay? And, and he's afraid he'll still be seeing it when he comes again. Another thing he fears is lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. You get a sense of his three fears mentioned in those verses? I fear that we're not going to see what we would hoped for in one another. I fear that there'll still be disputation and contention and everything else that President Nelson just condemned last conference. And I fear that I'll have cause to mourn if you didn't feel sufficient godly sorrow to mourn for your own sins and repent of them. That's what I'm worried about as a missionary. Can you picture him writing this second letter? Wondering if he'll need to write a third? Wondering if, if he'll need to return a third time? What will I find? Will I find true disciples or former saints? Well, his final words then come in chapter 13. And it's a short oh, capstone to these two beautiful letters we spent the last month plus studying. He starts it in verse 1, This is the third time I am coming to you. Which again is why we think that 2 Corinthians must be at least 3rd Corinthians. Just like 1 Corinthians must have been at least 2 Corinthians since then he talks about a previous time he'd written already. Well, whatever number this is, here Paul calls it the third time he's coming. And then he invokes the Old Testament law of witnesses to suggest why he keeps writing and keeps coming. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So have I come enough and written enough to establish these words? Establish my street cred? Establish the reality of the resurrection? Establish the gospel of Jesus Christ? Ah, I told you before, he said, and foretell you, as if I were present the second time, and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other, that if I come again, oh, I will not spare, since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. You see what he's saying there? Do you need me to come again? How many repetitions do you need? How many additional witnesses must the Lord send? Whether in terms of additional people, Titus, Timothy, others, this brother that I haven't named, or how many additional visits from the same messenger to keep confirming the truth of what I've already said. How, how does God establish his doctrine? Well, he says it repeatedly. He gives multiple witnesses. And we can bank on those things we have heard over and over from the servants of God. What he's worried about, like he says at the end there, is it just if I had to come again as a fourth witness, for example, I'm not going to be able to spare. I won't be able to hold back. I'll have to be the, the mean disciplinarian. If you won't humble yourself, will I have to come and humble you? If you won't let your hearts be pricked, will, will they have to be cut asunder? That's, that's not how I want to come. But I'll come and give you whatever proof you need that Christ is indeed speaking through me. But he also says in verse 4 through 6, speaking of Jesus, for though he was crucified through weakness, and there's Jesus meekly allowing himself to be killed, 
though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. He rose triumphant from the grave. Let's get back to that. I'm a witness of the resurrection after all. And we try to do the same. We're crucified in our own way through our own weakness. And yet here we are living by the power of God. That's what he says next. We also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. So how's this for some parting advice? I love what Paul is saying here. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. That's what Paul's been doing this whole time, trying to prove himself to them. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, at least if you'll let him in, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. We have let the Lord in. But think about the way he put it there in the middle. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Take advantage of your weekly introspection at the sacrament table. Give yourself a long, hard look. Not just in the glass darkly. No, (laughs) wipe the mirror clean. And try to look at yourself the way the Lord does, with an all-searching eye. Don't sugarcoat things. Don't try to rationalize or justify Truly examine yourself. Assess your faith. Measure your testimony. How am I doing? If I still recognize weakness, which we all will, is it weakness that is learning to rely upon the strength of the Lord? If I still see flaws and thorns and everything else, is it helping me make progress? Or am I falling further and further into my sins? Often I will do this with people when they're struggling in their faith and we're having one-on-one conversations. I will try to help them examine themselves whether they really be in the faith. We'll talk about how deep the cracks in the foundation go. Is it just surface level, church issues? Is it down deeper? Do you still believe in Jesus? Is it deeper down to the point of bedrock itself? Do you believe in God? Let's examine. Because if... If you think it's just a, a, a sliver on a surface level and you're just asking for a little help with a Band-Aid, we've got to know if, if there's cancer down deep or I'm wasting your time. Or let's go through the fourth article of faith and is your faith really in the Lord Jesus Christ or has it been in something else? As you're moving down and up the fourth article of faith, we've talked about that before. What stage of faith are you in? Are you in creation or fall or atonement? And in what areas? There is so much self-examination that needs to take place to see if we really are in the faith and different aspects of my faith. And is it a, a personal or a communal faith? Am I holding on to mere social conversion when spiritual conversion is no longer present. There are really important questions we need to be asking ourselves to to self-assess whether or not we really are in the faith. Because a lot of people are struggling. And I fear that they weren't sufficiently self-aware. We were, we kind of lulled ourselves into a false sense of security, like, well, I'm active, isn't that enough? Well, Time will tell. Examine yourself and we'll see really where your faith, how strong it is. Paul then says in verse 7 through 9, Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. So here's some more fatherly advice. Not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. And I don't care what you think about us. If you think we're reprobates, fine. Just don't be a reprobate yourself. Be honest, don't do evil. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. God is always striving to move us in a better direction. So even if you think we're getting in the way, well, I'll leave you and God, I'll leave you in His perfect hands, and it will all be for the truth. For we are glad, He says, when we are weak and ye are strong. 
and this also we wish, even your perfection. That's all we've ever wished for. It's all we've ever worked for. And so if you think we're weak, fine. Then please be strong. If you don't think I'm a true messenger, so be it. I pray you'll accept the true message. Hold on to the faith that we have delivered. I lay hold upon the truth. It will set you free. It will bring you to God. It will perfect you. And that's all we've ever hoped. The word there is so beautiful. We've talked about perfection before, about teleos, something way off in the distance. Uh, be therefore perfect in those ways. It's a beautiful Greek word for this perfection. This one uses a different one, a different word that actually means something closer to preparing or equipping or making fit or making adjustments so things work the way they should. It's really interesting. That's the kind of perfection that they've been wishing. All I've been doing in coming to Corinth and writing letters to the Corinthians is pulling out my screwdriver and kind of tinkering with things and trying to fix that and trying to adjust that and just get you closer and closer to, the, to perfection in Christ. Some other translations actually render this phrase that you will become mature or that you will be made complete or my favorite one, that ye may be fully restored. Imagine all the tweaking, all the adjusting that re is required if you're trying to restore an old engine, for example, or restore a full car, or to restore a full person. Remember the way Section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants starts? The restoration God is most interested in is not the restoration of the gospel or the restoration of the church or the restoration of the priesthood. The restoration Jesus himself talks about in DNC 84 too is the restoration of my people. He's the one tinkering. He's the one adjusting until that engine just purrs. Until our, our souls can smoothly walk the path of covenant. That's, that's what apostles are after. More than anything, no matter what people think of them, their service is focused on our restoration, to be restored to a right relationship with God, a reminder of who we really are. And then Paul brings this letter to a close. Verse 10, Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. There really we are back to that. Like, yep, I'd rather do this from a distance so I can, whew, I can be strong, I can be clear, and then hopefully when I'm in your presence, I can be calm and collected and just loving and kind and congratulations, you're all doing great, okay? But if you don't, then yes, I'll have to be sharper when I return. Think back to section 121 about reproving betimes with sharpness, but then showing more love than ever to prove that you really are on their side. Think about section 50 of the Doctrine and Covenants and its focus on edification over anything else. That's what Paul is after here. I'm not trying to destroy through my sharpness. I'm trying to edify by being clear in my calls to repent. And so, verse 11 through 14, finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. And again, it's this, be properly adjusted. Be restored to your right function. Think about all the areas you've been falling short and just let's tweak a few things. Please be perfect. In the meantime, be of good comfort. Think about everything Paul has said about affliction, especially in this second letter. Be of one mind. Live in peace. Think about all that Paul has taught about internal divisions and trying to become one. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Oh, greet one another with an holy kiss or JST, and holy salutation. And speaking of salutations, I'll send you one from a distance. All the saints salute you. We are in this together, after all. Hopefully provoking one another, 
to continue progressing towards God and becoming more and more faithful and like Him every step of the way. And what will you need to get there? Paul's final words here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Paul has invoked the entire Godhead, all three members, because we'll need all that each one provides. And notice the division of labor. I, I love this verse, this ending. From God the Father, what will he give us? Love. He is the Father of mercies, after all. From Jesus, what will we receive? Grace. Enabling power. And what will we receive from the Holy Ghost? Communion. He's the one that makes us one. He's the one that helps us resonate on that same frequency. Communion with each other and with God. Oh, we talk about the gifts of the wise men. <laughs> well, how about the, the, this gift from the greatest three that have ever, ever existed? Love and grace and communion is exactly what God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost want to give. And Paul is commending all of that from them to us. Well, my friends, 2 Corinthians has come to its close. And off to Galatians next week. But can we, by way of review, just repeat some of the beautiful phrases Paul has given us in this week's study. Ponder each of these phrases. In fact, if any of them really stand out, I'd love to read them in the comments. Anything that you feel like you want to spend more time pondering. Their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. To their power and beyond their power. The fellowship of the ministering. To prove the sincerity of your love. For your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now therefore perform the doing of it. I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. God loveth a cheerful giver. Always having all sufficiency in all things. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Do not be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I seek not yours, but you. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. And finally, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. My dear friends, I pray that our self-examination will be eye-opening, that we will feel godly sorrow for whatever aspects of that examination bring up room for improvement. I pray we'll have a soft enough heart 
to offer it to God in its brokenness so he can give us healing as only he can. Examine your faith. Time will tell if it's strong enough to see us through the latter days. I pray that it will. I testify of the Lord of whom Paul testified. I bear my witness of the Lord of the resurrection, the way, the truth, and the life. I am grateful for his strength, which more than makes up for my weakness. In fact, having come to know him through my weakness, I can glory even in that, as my ultimate goal is to glory in him.